Hello, I am Mark Morris, choreographer and artistic director of the Mark Morris Dance Group. And we're here at the Glamorous Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., where we're performing tonight and a couple of shows more with the Silk Road Ensemble and some of the greatest musicians of Azerbaijan. Look it up if you don't know where that is. Um, and uh, I'm here to ask, answer questions that you have asked, and some have been planted, some are fake, but most of them are we, will be real, and I will only tell the truth. Okay, here we go. Uh, question one. What do you see as the legacy of the tale of Leila and Majnun? And how does that inform this production? That's two questions. Leila and Majnun is a long story about a long story. Um, in, we're performing this in a version that was written uh, in the early 20th century incorporating uh, European opera with Azerbaijani traditional uh, mogam, as the style of singing is called. So the Azerbaijani element is the score that was then arranged uh, in order to suit this ensemble, which includes Western strings, uh, Chinese pipa, and um, Japanese shakuhachi, the flute, and the four Azerbaijani musicians, two of them are singers, uh, Alim Kasimov and his daughter Fargana, um, are the singers who play Leili and Majno. And then the uh, musicians, basically the continuum musicians, the engine of the piece, uh, play the spike fiddle, which is called a, you know, it's a bowed string instrument called uh, chamanche, and a uh, tar, which is basically a plucked string instrument as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, tail. Oh, so anyway, the story is, look it up because it's a really uh, long, complicated, fabulous, beautiful story from the Islamic tradition, Sufi tradition. It predates, what people compare it to Romeo and Juliet, it predates Romeo and Juliet by 500 years. And um, this is based on the Azerbaijani compilation of these poems. Um, uh, and because it was the, in the sort of the troubadour tradition when all poetry and uh, singing were the same thing. You were, a, you were a bard and you told stories. Of course, the oral tradition, there was very little written language in the big spread of the, uh, of the Muslim world. So this story in the, in the States isn't very well known, but anywhere else uh, from uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, through Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, India, um, the steppes of Central Asia, Azerbaijan, um, uh, Iran, because uh, you know, the stories were writ originally in Persian. So it's, as I'm, I'm giving you a tiny short version of a long and fabulously fascinating story. The two people fall in love, never, it's never, uh, it's never corporealized, and they end up dying. Sounds horrible, however, it's a beautiful vehicle and a, a metaphor for achieving the desire and fulfillment of meeting the universe. Of It can be taken as God or eternal love or just a big, big picture of the world and how love works better than hate. Next question, Ben. <coughs> ben asks, how do you begin developing a piece rooted in a culture different from yours? Good question, Ben. Um, the story is, I was asked, this probably covers several different questions here, but I was asked probably a dozen years ago by Yo-Yo Ma, cellist, who also was the founder of the Silk Road uh, Ensemble, and uh, he asked me to come and hear a concert of some music by the Kazimovs, the singers that, we're, that are in this show. And they had done, a, with the Silk Road Ensemble, a version of this opera. Um, and I went, they, were at, they asked me if I would be interested in producing a concert, a, you know, a presentation, a, a show, a theater show, as opposed to just a concert, which is kind of enough. Um, and so I went to see this wonderful show in an earlier form, and it was tremendously sad and moving and beautiful. And at breakfast the next morning, they asked me if I would, if they said, you're the only person who is qualified to do this, and I agreed. And then they asked if I would do it, and I said no, because it wasn't, to me, ready enough. It was too short and too sad, to put it frankly, and I wanted more of the peppier music, more of the, uh, 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 more variety, so it isn't just a very uh, dour and poignant and beautiful show from beginning to end. 
So we added music, um, arranging the music with the, the uh, great uh, assistance and motivation of Johnny Gandelsman and Colin Jacobson and Alim Kasimov himself, assembled a, an arrangement of this score for eight uh, members of the Silk Road Ensemble and four of the Azerbaijani musicians and their Mughum uh, tradition. So they revised the score, added some more music to it. I investigated for years and about two, two years ago or so, I agreed to take on the project and went to work finalizing a performance edition of the music, um, the numbers we wanted to do, and then starting to design consult with the set designer, costume designers, et cetera, so that everyone was starting uh, sort of from the same material, the same support material. That's the end of that answer. Okay, how about, oh, this is good. Um, this is easy. Jane asks, what was your company's very first work performed at the Kennedy Center? Well, Jane, I don't know, but I can tell you that our first series of performances here were at the Eisenhower Theater. Um, and they, I think that was 1985. Um, so obviously I'm way too old to remember the details of that. But my company was founded in 1980, so that was pretty, pretty soon after that. And since then we've performed here many times with many different scales of uh, shows in the different theaters. Let's see. I'm pretending to think while I look at this screen. Hmm. Oh, Josh asks, do any of the steps in Leila and Majnun come from traditional Azerbaijani dance? Yes. Um, I want to go back to a piece rooted in a culture different from yours, because in saying the answer to that, the did I, it kind of asks, did you do any homework? Which I as, uh, I, as a paranoid, would say, of course I did. What do you think? I just make this up. I do both of those things. I do a, a lot of research. <coughs> I made a trip to Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, to, to meet people uh, who, because I wanted uh, more singers to have around just in case and to learn the piece and to uh, learn more about this culture, which is related to many other cultures, but very distinct. And of course, that was, uh, you know, for many years, depending on how you look at it, m muffled or obliterated by being uh, part of the Soviet Union. So, of course, like everywhere, you weren't allowed to speak you know, uh, Latvian or Ukrainian or Azerbaijani, and everyone still did, but you had to learn Russian. So um, I went there, I went to, and I, I watched a great deal of film and read all of the poems, and I did take some, I would say citations from the dances of Azerbaijan and the surrounding region, and um, I didn't want it to uh, be direct quotations of this of the work, but there there are many many elements of it that you could recognize from. I'm sorry to hurt anybody's feelings, but Georgian dance or um, uh, Sufi traditional dance and Pakistani dance and uh, Arabian dance, generally Arabian dance, and uh, incorporated those things into uh, what I would do. My screen's gone, but I can just pretend. So um, one thing is, uh, the, a question is about the collaborators. The, the, sta the, the, the show happens on a particular arrangement of platforms so that it makes like a village square, and I wanted it, the dance is sort of tilted, so you can the dancers dance in a square and in the middle. The musicians of Silk Road are toward the back of the stage in two clusters of four, and the musicians and singers from Azerbaijan are on sort of, <coughs> sorry, sort of a plinth down center because I wanted everybody visible, everyone participating in the show, and there's some candles, and there's an incredibly beautiful backdrop done by the fabulous um, and unfortunately dead a year ago, Howard Hodgkin, who was one of the, Sir Howard Hodgkin, he hated if you called him Sir, who was a good friend of mine and collected uh, paintings, uh, uh, Mughal paintings, Mughal period paintings from, uh, you know, northeast, uh, in northern India and into Pakistan and the Middle East. So he had a huge collection of these um, miniature paintings from the 14th and 15th century and that many of them, of course, or refer to the 
to the uh, story of Layla and Majnun. You're here. We could, there's a person here who's fixing this because I can't see, but I can just talk about it because I know everything about this show. So I can pretend I'm getting a question, but I can also just tell you, oh, how did you meet the late Howard Hodgkin and begin work? Good question, whoever wrote this that I just answered most of. I think I'm pretty sure I met Howard something like 20-something years ago, and it was through a mutual friend of ours, Susan Sontag, the late, great Susan Sontag, and her lover at the time, Annie Leibovitz, the photographer. Um, and so uh, Howard and I became very close friends, and he, uh, he lived, lived in London and uh, wintered, because who wants to winter in London? He wintered in Mumbai, in India, and he had been going to India for, I don't know, 50 years, and he actually completed the painting that serves as the backdrop for this piece. Um, one of the last things he did, and he showed it to me in his studio and apartment in, in Mumbai when I was visiting, and said, I just finished this painting, you want to go look at it, it's still wet. And he said the painting was called Love and Death, kind of a coincidence, or was it? And so I went into the room and there was this big, wet, dripping painting on the wall and I had to watch my step. And he waited in the other room to see if I would approve it. And I did, and it's magic. And so James F. Ingalls, brilliant lighting designer, is the person who makes it visible. And uh, you know, all of the musicians and dancers are responsible for what the show comes off as, but I'm fully to blame for the overall uh, idea and picture of the whole thing. And it's amazing. Look it up, because you know, there's so much information available in our magic machines that work or not. Let's see, just need a second. Oh, also, I wanted to say this about working with other cultures. There's no other kind of culture than other culture. So I'll get in trouble for this, but I don't care um, because <clears throat> I, you know, people, the, a big uh, a hot topic, hot pocket, a hot topic um, is cultural appropriation. And I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or hurt everyone's feelings equally. Um, I don't think there's any other kind of culture. And my embarrassing kindergarten analogy for this is, you know, the, the noodles came from China and the tomatoes came from Central America and then they magically turned into spaghetti, you know? So hooray for that. And there's no pure language. The purer there is a language, the more likely it's a fascist society. And, you know, of course, I'm not going to do a big uh, political thing, but, you know, there's been a great deal of, I hate to use this word, but I will, Islamophobia. And so I'm not offering a corrective in any way to the political situation. I'm not a political person in my work. But this is a beautiful, tender, old, profound story about love and kindness and devotion. And that's why it's important at any time, but also particularly at this time. OK, Aaron asks, W, good question. Um, Alejandra asks, I am from a Latin country. Any production in particular that has caught your attention the most? Huh? Let's see. Oh, Bruce asks, miniatures depict Majnun hugging the sarcophagus of Layla where Majnun dies of heartbreak. There are many beautiful paintings of this scene. How did you interpret it in the piece? Good question. Um, because I use a lot of information, research, uh, empirical experience, gossip, um, meeting people, my own history, my interest in music of the world, and dance cul in culture in general. Um, these paint the, the poems themselves in the uh, version by Nizami and then Fuzili in the, in the Azerbaijani version, um, there are so many stories within those poems that aren't directly represented in the text of the show that we're presenting. So there are many references in the poems to a uh, candle. It's, a, it's also a Sufi image of the candle that the flame illuminates and also consumes itself simultaneously. So the, the, the birth and death being simultaneous, which is a, a Christian thing, the Alpha and Omega, or a, a, a Judeo-Christian thing, the Alpha and the Omega. Um, and so, and there are images of the sun and the moon and Majnun, which means crazy or obsessed or lovesick. His real name was Kais, but it you know, doesn't work as well. So to this day, people talk about 
in many of the languages of the region talk about someone being Majnun as being crazy, um, uh, usually with love, obsessed with something. And so Majnun, be, them being separated, she was married off to somebody. He wasn't. He became unsuitable for marriage because he was only interested in her and she only in him, so she never had sex with her, hus her husband. He wasn't evil, and he was within the same tribe, but it was the wrong relationship, if you know what I'm saying. And so Majnun was sort of banished by himself and went and lived in the desert, and in a beautiful way, which isn't reflected in this text, like St. Francis, he was protected by the wild animals with whom he could communicate, and in the beautiful poetic idea, he was writing poems, which were, of course, songs at the same time, in sand that would, as we all know from writing love letters in the sand, they disappear. Um, same thing, he would write on pieces of paper or leaves and the wind would carry them away and other Bedouins, other travelers would find these and take them to Layla because they were obviously meant for her. So she was in contact with his love and he would walk around her palace uh, when nobody was around. It was a terrible scene and she died uh, she died probably because she couldn't handle not being with her love and he died at the in many versions at her grave site so you can go many many way, many ways with this story the way we've gone is directed by the brevity of this the, it's very compact the the version that they do in Baku every year is probably three hours long and is a cast of thousands and it's incredible, look it up on YouTube. I've watched it many times and it's thrilling, but it doesn't quite work here. Um, and that's the end of that, let's see. <coughs> Let me see. Uh, no, let's in, oh, here's one. In the work, you have four different couples portraying Leila and Majnun. Why have multiple dancers portray each role instead of one through-line couple for the whole work? Well, that's pragmatic. Um, first of all, I really don't like to see um, shows where the, the musicians or the singers are having a thought balloon, a thought bubble, and that is filled with dancers. So that dancers are like the American Sign Language of a singer's thoughts or a, a musician's thoughts. So, First of all, you don't have to have anybody who plays Leila and Majnun. You don't have to have any dancing at all. The music does it. But in, in deciding to do it this way, the, four, the five acts of the, of the opera, don't worry, they're very short. The, in the first four, a different couple, male-female couple, portray the characters of Leila and Majnun. And that's partly uh, just common sense because we were working, in a, a, uh, again, in a form of music that was pretty foreign to me, I don't speak Azerbaijani. The music is very, very beautifully, but strictly uh, improvisational. So I allowed each couple to concentrate on the text of one act of this, which in, their, in school kids, then their, their parents disapprove of them being lovers, and then she's married off to uh, a guy she doesn't love, and then Oh, something else happens. Oh, there's just like general despair and longing, and they die at the end. So the, the Western style music <coughs> by uh, Haji Bailey, who is the composer I neglected to mention, um, Haji Bailey composed these, you know, Western sounding things. You know, end of the 19th, uh, 19th century sounds like Khachaturian or Galier or uh, Rimsky-Korsakov. And so that music is easily recognizable and repeatable. And the Mogam singing is quite open, not chaos, not free form, but very specifically and culturally uh, and ecstatically presented. It's different every night. Um, so the dancers who are playing Leila and Majnun uh, are particularly tuned into that part of the music and know the words and have a particular specific communication with the singers and the, the players, the Azerbaijanis who run the show. So, it was easier. The, the, here's the answer, it was easier. And it also gives everyone a chance to dance and they get older as it goes along, although the dancers of course don't, they're all exactly the same age. Um, it's also interesting. Okay, let's see. Oh, Meg asks, hmm, do you ever listen to music for fun? 
or, this isn't written right, or do you always consider your listening some sort of scouting? That's good too. I'll tell you, I used to listen to music every second I was awake and sometimes when I was asleep. I'm obsessed with music. I would listen on headphones until I kept worrying it's out again. I kept worrying that this seat doesn't work. Tech, the tech, ladies and gentlemen, sorry, everybody, the technology is, uh, what's the word? A Potemkin village. Um, so let's see, let me see what that says. Uh, so she asked, what did she ask? Meg asked about, what was that? What was that do again? I to music for fun? Oh, yeah, do I listen for fun? Um, I used to listen constantly every second. It's thrilling. I prefer live music to recorded music, of course, which is why every show we do is with live music. I don't use any recorded music. Um, so I used to all the time, and then I did less so because now in my rehearsals, I always have live music. I have a pianist who plays for class and rehearsal. <coughs> Um, and we only dance with live music in our shows. So I get, I'm so full of live music by the time I come home from work that I listen to zero music or I study a piece of music or more fun is if someone comes over to visit, I say, listen to this, you've got to hear this. And then I play something that I've known for 40 years or just found out that day. So music is a big, big part of my life, but I don't just put it on for background usually. Um, that's the answer to that. Okay, what else? Oh, is that what I'm supposed to say now? Okay, you ready? <coughs> <coughs> and I'm afraid we are out of time, but thank you all for your questions. Remember, colon, <coughs> Mark Morris Dance Group will be here at the Kennedy Center performing the incredible, moving, never going to get a chance to see it again, Layla and Majnun, tonight through March 24th. And I hope to see you there, but I won't see you there because it's dark. I'll just trust that you're coming. And really, it's worth it. If you think you hate opera, come. If you think you hate dance, come. Because there's so much in this that'll just make you crazy and bring a handkerchief because it's sad. Thank you.